In our previous video, we wrote a behavior-driven design unit test based on a behavior-driven design requirements document that we've written for our program. So the test does not currently compile. It is a test-driven design test, so we would expect that the test won't pass when we first write it and possibly won't even compile. Now the com compilation error is going to be easy to fix. You see what I've done here is I am creating a new class called, or I'm creating an object of a class called plant DAO stub. That class does not exist. So let's try this with a couple of different approaches. I'm going to choose new and I'm going to choose Java class and I'm going to say, what do we call that guy? I think plant DAO stub. I just want to make sure I have the capitalization right. Plant DAO stub. Okay. Now, what I should do is define the interface as I plant DAO here, and you see it auto-completes for me, so that's nice and easy. But I'm not going to do that just yet because I want to show what happens when I don't do that. I add the class, go ahead and add it to Git, and our, our program still does not compile. I import the class. We have a class now, and it does not compile because we get this message that's called incompatible types. It says, hey, wait a minute, the variable type is the interface I plant DAO, and the object type is plant DAO stub. These two items are not related, therefore I cannot assign an object of type plant DAO stub to an interface, a variable of type I plant DAO. That's an easy fix. We just go to our plant DAO stub and say implements I plant DAO, and that's exactly what would have happened had I selected that interface I plant DAO during the wizard. Here I'm doing it later. Either way is fine. Probably a bit easier to do it in the wizard. Now, as soon as I implement an interface, I'm under contract to implement all methods of that interface, and that's why I'm getting the red line that you see here. So I Alt Enter and implement methods, and there's the search method we defined in the interface. Add it, OK, and save, and now take a look my unit test compiles. Oh, but does it pass? Let's see that. I right click and I say run and I would be very surprised if it passed because I haven't actually provided any details uh, in this class. So you see it's building now and then as soon as it finishes building it will run our unit test. And as expected the unit test fails with a null pointer exception. Now why a null pointer exception? Well, let's see. If I take a look at this, we're trying to iterate over a collection of plants. We take a look here, again, iterating over a collection of plants. And we take a look here. Okay, we're, we're in the previous call. We take a look here and we're calling plants.size. Each of these requires calling a method on this variable called plants. And plants is what is returned from uh, this plantdao.search. If we go to our plantdao stub, what are we actually returning? We're returning null. If your object type is null and you try to call a method on that object, you'll get a null pointer exception. That's the definition of a null pointer exception. So let's try and take care of that. I'm going to start by declaring a variable list, plant ETO, and then we'll call this one all plants. And we'll say equals new array list and then plant DTO again. Open and close print terminate with the semicolon, alt enter to organize imports. And now let's say return all plants. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and run the unit test again and see if we have any differences because at least now I'm not returning null. Last time all three tests failed. You can see that right down here. Let's run it one more time and see what results we get. Slightly different this time. Three tests done, two failed, which indicates that one succeeded. Now, which are the two that failed? Uh, search when search for red, redbud receive one Circus canadensis. Search when search for Quercus return to oaks. So these two have failed. And indeed, if I click, we can see where they failed. This one failed on the assert true. Uh, this one also failed on the assert true. The one that did not fail was the garbage one because the success criteria there is simply that we return nothing and, and we get nothing in return. And we can even see it over here on the left. Uh, search when search for garbage receive nothing. You see that one the success criteria is getting nothing and at this point that's all our stub is doing is it's returning nothing. So let's try and make the other two pass. I'm going to start by making a collection of plants. Let me give myself a little bit of room 
uh, because of course everything has to be above the return statement. So I'm going to say uh, plant DTO uh, white oak equals new plant DTO. Okay. And then white oak dot set genus. And we'll say Quercus. Okay. White oak set species uh, Alba. And finally, white oak dot set common. And guess what? White oak. Okay, and not and let's not forget the part I always forget, all plants dot add. And then white oak. Okay, let's do our English oak. So plant DTO English oak equals new plant DTO. Okay. Uh, English oak dot set genus. Oh, species. We got that one by mistake, so we'll go ahead and say rover. And I'll put English oak set genus. We'll put that as Quercus. Okay. And English oak dot set common. And we'll say English oak. Terminate with the semicolon. Do the part I always forget. All plants dot add English oak. Okay. And then uh, Paul Paul will go ahead and add our Paul Paul as well. So uh, I'm sorry, our uh, our Circus canadensis eastern redbud, and add that to our collection of plants. So now we have three plants. Surely we could have more, but now we can uh, now we can make a simple filtering mechanism. So you know what? I don't actually want to return all plants. I only want to return matching plants. Matching plants. So let me make another collection. We'll say list plant DTO matching plants equals new array list plant DTO, just like so. Okay. And now we're only going to add to the matching plants, only add to the matching plants where the plant contains the search term and one of its attributes. Okay, so now I'm going to take a little, I'm going to kind of take a shortcut in finding the matching plants. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, control I, whoops, nope, control J uh, for each. We'll do it like so. I'm going to iterate over the collection of all plants. So plant DTO, plant, colon, all plants. Okay, and just tidy this up a bit. I'll call it find the match. I shouldn't call that plant DTO. I, I, I'll call it candidate plant. Only because I already have a variant. You know what? Hang on one second. I'm going to do just a bit of refactoring. Just a moment. Okay, looking a little better. I had called this variable up above. I called it plant, which caused a conflict with the variable down here. Instead of renaming this iteration variable, it makes more sense to rename this variable up here. Now, let's think about our given win then. Let's think about our test. We're searching for... In, in one test, we're searching for a common name, which is Redbud. In the other test, we're searching for a genus, which is Quercus. And then the other test, we're simply searching for garbage. So one requirement we have is that the search term can be across any of these fields. So we need to search them all. A good way to do this is to go back to our plant DTO and see if it has a two-string method, and it does not. So let's make one. A two-string method just returns a string representation of a class. If I start typing two-string, Android Studio IntelliJ already knows what I want to do, and it fills out this method for me. So instead of return super.toString, I can return genus plus maybe a space, then species, plus, and then a space, plus cultivar. And you might be saying, why aren't you calling the getter methods? Well, feel free to if you want, just a little shorthand for me. I'm I'm using the um, just the attribute names directly since I'm in the class called plant DTO. So now I've made my two string method, which is going to return the genus, the species, the cultivar, and the common all in one line. And that's going to make my stub a whole lot easier because now I have to say if plant dot two string dot contains search term, boom, we've met our criteria. If it if the if that entire string of the plant contains whatever search term the user has passed in here, then we're going to add it to our collection of matching plants. So matching plants dot add plant. Okay, and I'll put some comments to that effect. If any of the attributes of this plant 
match the user's search term, add it to our collection of plants. Okay, I feel pretty good, but you know what? How am I going to know for sure if it works? Well, there's one easy way. Let's go ahead and run our test and see how many tests pass. Just a moment as this builds and runs. And magic, take a look, all tests pass. So I can click, I can see that all tests pass. A handy thing about new versions of Android Studio, it is common to have a whole lot of tests uh, in one test file. Notice that every method that is annotated with that test is where my test begins. Notice also that it has this little replay button next to it, or this run button next to it. That allows us to run these tests in isolation. So I can click here and I can run just this first test, and we can see just that one test pass. Click on the next one, run this one, and see just that test pass. Additionally, if you were looking there, you might have seen there's also a debug option. Well, guess what? Sure enough, you can debug tests as well. That's really handy if you're getting a red line and you're not sure why, okay? One more that we wanna see is run test with coverage. This is really, really nice because what this is going to do is it's going to run our tests and then it's going to give us a coverage report on our on our project. So take a look at plant DAO stub. Do you see this? 100% methods, 100% of lines covered. Okay, you see plant DTO, 46% of methods, 46% of lines covered. So this will give us a good metric and you see a little more over here to the right. This will give us a good metric on what we have covered and what we don't have covered, which will show us where we have gaps in running our, our tests. It's probably a bit faint to look at in this video, but if you see right where my cursor is here, uh, it is showing us unit test code coverage in Android Studio. And I can, there's a, a very faint green bar right here. We can click on and we can see the coverage. This is of our plant DAO stub. Because our plant DTO was also used, we can click and we can see here that some but not all of this was covered with a unit test. We didn't write a unit test against the global unique identifier, so that has a little red marker. We did against get and set genus, so that has a green marker, and that's why for our DTO, it's only partially covered. So you see our DTO is 46% coverage, and the red and the green here are showing us where the coverage is and where the coverage is lacking. So that's a good look at implementing a class to make a unit test pass. This goes along with a few other videos I've done on unit testing. I hope this has been helpful to you, and if you have any thoughts or any suggestions on what you've done with behavior-driven design, leave them in the comments. I'd love to see it. Thank you.